Brothers and sisters in Islam, back again to the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we have spoken a lot. We are now at the number 33 of the seerah topic. And uh, we've come towards the end, inshallah. So I'm going to focus on the major uh, occurrences and what I think uh, matters to us today. Any lessons that we can extract that will benefit you and me, will benefit our community. I will talk about them, inshallah ta'ala. So I think uh, we're looking at maybe three more, three more classes after this, and then we'll have a break. And then inshallah, we'll see what other series we can come up with. But I will, I will, uh, I'll be busy for a little while after this one, and inshallah, we'll return. If you want to tune in to uh, my Facebook page, I will have... Uh, I'll have dates, inshallah, ready for you. I'll announce it, inshallah ta'ala. Preston Mosque uh, Facebook page also has it. So we'll find a way to get it out to you, inshallah, and you'll find out. Uh, so now I want to talk to you about where I left off last time, and we're going to move on from the incident of the Battle of Khaybar. Do you remember the Battle of Khaybar that we spoke about two weeks ago? And then we had a break, we talked about the youth issues, and now, inshallah, I continue from what happened after the Battle of Khaybar. So, after conquering Khaybar and establishing the peace treaty with the Meccans, the Prophet ﷺ had eaten some food from Khaybar from a Jewish woman who had invited him. He trusted what she said, but unfortunately she had poison in that food. After he ate from that poison, we spoke about that last class, Rasul said that he felt the pain of this poison in his stomach. He felt the pain of it in his body, which lasted till his death. So this happened in about the end or the beginning of the sixth year of Hijrah. And then for the next five years, the Prophet ﷺ kept feeling the pain every now and then. And there is a famous quote from the Prophet ﷺ at the time of his death. When he used to say to his wives and to others who could hear him, Al-Abbas and Abdullah, his uncle's cousin, uncle's son, and others, he used to say to them, I can still feel the pain of the food, poisoned food that I ate in Khaybar. Five years later at his deathbed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why some companions, including Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, we assume that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a shaheed, a martyr, m- murdered, from the poison of the woman in Khaybar who, who fed it to him. And there was a combination of other sicknesses the Prophet ﷺ went to. But this is one, one quote, one narration that they think, some Sahabas thought that he had died a shaheed, a martyr. A martyr is somebody who is either murdered or dies protecting his family or her family or protecting their wealth, their property. A shaheed is also a person who has died drowning, or a person who dies burning, or a person who dies from a permanent illness. In the olden days they call it ta'un. The ulama say it's equivalent to cancer and the likes of it, terminal illnesses. A person who is murdered, uh, a woman who dies while giving birth. It's a, it's a status of shaheed, a higher status that they are privileged on the Day of Judgment with special privileges that others don't get. The highest form of a shaheed, a martyr, is somebody who is killed in the cause of Allah. They have gone out to do something in the path of Allah, to protect Muslims, to uphold Islam, to fight in a battle, to protect and defend Islam and Muslims against the enemy. And the highest form of shaheed is one, as the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Hadith, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, 
And the highest form of a person who dies as a shaheed, is high status, is someone who says a truthful word in front of a tyrant ruler. Somebody who he knows or she knows that if they were to say the truthful word that will save or protect people or liberate whatever it is, and he or she knows that they could die from this tyrant ruler and they are killed in that cause by saying a word of truth is the highest form of martyrdom, shaheed. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was considered by some companions to have died a shaheed in the cause of Islam after the battle of Khaybar from the Jewish woman who poisoned his food. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ignored the pain and has to continue in his mission. He seized the opportunity of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Remember the Treaty of Peace. No more wars. No more battle. No more attack between the Muslims and the Meccans who had been in hostility right up to this point from the moment the Prophet ﷺ had began his message as a prophet of God. And there were allies to the Muslims and allies to the Meccans. In the terms of the treaty, it meant that even the allies, the allies means the people who have a peace treaty with someone. They defend them if they were attacked. And if whoever gets attacked, the other allies have to defend them. One of the allies of the Muslims was called Banu Khuza'a, the Khuza'a people. And some of them had embraced Islam and some of them didn't. They remained on idolatry, but they were all allies to the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. There was another group called Banu Bakr. You don't have to learn the names, but just so that we can identify them, so the story can make sense. They were the allies of Meccans. Anyone who attacks Banu Bakr, then they are attacking Mecca. And whoever attacks Mecca has attacked Abu Bakr. Like that. So what happened? Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left it there. And he seized this opportunity to do what? To give da'wah to the people outside of Arabia. All of Arabia now knows about Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had opened the door for anybody to embrace Islam without harming anyone. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seized the opportunity to send letters he sent letters to the people outside of Arabia, to the kings and the emperors of the world. Da'wah of Islam is not restricted to your people. Because the Prophet وسلم, Muhammad وسلم, why is he called the seal of the Prophet, the end of all prophethood? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the last prophet of all of them to the entire world. Every prophet before the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad ﷺ, Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Dawood, Sulaiman, uh, Yusuf ﷺ, Yaqub, uh, all of them, all of the prophets before were only sent to their own people, their own tribes. They weren't preaching to people outside of their tribes. And there were one hadith, which is sahih, it says that there are more than a hundred and something thousand prophets that was sent to people before Muhammad Sallallahu Allah said in the Quran, the ayah which means, um, There isn't a single city or town or people except that a warner came to them, a prophet came to them. Allah says in the Quran, some messengers, we have sent messengers and prophets, some messengers we have told you their names and some we haven't. Some prophets we have told you their names, some of them we haven't. Some of them spoke to Allah, some of them didn't. We only know, for example, that Musa salam, spoke to Allah, but there were more prophets who spoke to Allah and Allah spoke to them directly. Because Allah said it in plural, plurality. He also said there are many other prophets and messengers. The point is, brothers and sisters, we only know 26 of them that Allah mentioned in the Quran, but there are many more. But Muhammad وسلم, the specialty about him was that he was the only prophet sent to the entire world including the humans and the jinns. You all know this, right? Rahmatan lil alameen. A mercy, as Allah calls him. His, his, his title is Mercy to all the worlds. To the animals, to the insects, to the jinns, to the birds, to the trees, to the humans, to everyone. All the worlds. So he sent these letters to all these kings. The emperor of Rome. The emperor of Persia. The ruler of Yemen, which was under the rule of Persia. The, em the rulers of other parts of Arabia, just outside of it. Rulers of Egypt, 
the Coptics, which was under the Roman Empire. The ruler of Ashan, Greater Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Syria that we know about today, uh, parts of Turkey and Jordan. This is all called Sham. The Romans, the, the Christians, the Romans, they were occupying them. Rasulullah sent letters to the rulers they were occupying them. They were Arab Christians. For Rasulullah did not leave a single emperor or king that he could reach except that he sent messengers with letters to them. And his letters all said the same thing almost. It said, from Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, to so-and-so, the great, the great emperor, the great king of, su of such and such a place. That's how the Prophet ﷺ addressed them. He didn't address them by their name. He addressed them by their title that they are called. So he gave honor and respect to the title and status of people. And when, you, when, when the Prophet ﷺ gave da'wah to these people and he mentioned their status, he's telling them in a way that they shouldn't be threatened. When he calls someone the Emperor the Great, right? Alexander, Alexander the Great, um, Heraclius the Great, right? These words, he's telling them in other words, you remain the Great even after embracing Islam. I don't want your kingdom. And you can rule in your kingdom. You don't have to do anything. But I'm a messenger of God calling into Islam out of the darkness into the light. So he used to say from Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, first his name, to the great emperor of such and such a place. And he would say, As-salamu ala man al huda. Peace be upon whoever follows the right guidance. He can't say to them, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu as if they're Muslim. He can't, and he can't say to them, and not, not say salamu alaykum. So he wants to send peace upon them, but doesn't want them also to understand as if you are now allies of the Muslims and we accept you as you know, one of us while staying on your religion. It doesn't work that way. So he chose a middle ground. As-salamu ala man al huda. Peace be upon those who follow the right guidance. Another reason the Prophet ﷺ said peace be upon those who follow the right guidance was because they also were risky enemies. There is no peace contract with the Prophet ﷺ. So now the Prophet peace be upon him has to be political with them. Why? Because if I take you back in those days, that's how everybody was. Whoever's strong can legally attack and take over a country, a nation, a people. They don't need permission. That was a universal law. Anyone can do that. Having Islam come in, obviously Allah SWT forbid from attacking with unjustly. But it had to sort of fit in somewhere to protect itself. So the Muslims had to do the same. They can attack or pick up a war with someone whom they don't have a peace treaty with. But before they do that, the difference between Muslims and the rest of the world was that they had to give them three options first. Number one, invite them to Islam. If they enter Islam, they keep their kingdom and they are in a peaceful treaty with them. They're their brothers and sisters. That's it. Number two, if they don't accept that, they pay a tax, a type of tax called a jizya. And that tax is not just a tax to benefit the Muslims. It's a type of assurance. You pay us that and we will give you in, in exchange. Like it, it, comes with a, it comes with something in exchange. They're buying something basically. And what they're purchasing is the Muslims offer to protect them with their resources, their army, their soldiers. And they become almost like allies. They're not actually allies, but they're like allies. And what is it? They have a peace treaty together. If they attack the other people, the Muslims defend them. And if they attack, but they don't have to defend the Muslims in return. And there is peace between them. So they offered that. If they don't accept that, and, and the jizya, this tax thing, is really like uh, it was, how much did I say last time? Uh, one dinar per person per month. One dinar per citizen per month. One dinar is like a dollar or something. Something like that. I'm just guessing. Something very small. And if they don't accept that, no peace treaty, so they don't enter Islam, and the peace treaty was done that way, thirdly, it means you're an open enemy. Either you'll attack us or we'll attack you. We're, we're not safe. So the Prophet ﷺ sent these letters to them, and he would say, I invite you to Allah and to worship Him alone, and your kingdom remains yours.
your kingdom remains yours. So if anyone wants to say, well, Muhammad وسلم, he was going out to take over the world and, and make people convert by the sword, this is not true. Because the terms of it all and the conditions of it in those days are very different. You know, it's not like that. Rasul وسلم, invited them to Islam and he said, you keep your kingdom. Like we, we, don't, we won't interfere. But you become a Muslim and you invite your people to Islam. You don't force people to become Muslim if they don't want to. And if not, pay the jizya, just so that you know, we know that we are at peace. If not, then we're going to have to fight. because Not because either fight or, or become Muslim. It was because now we're open, we're vulnerable, like everyone else. I mean, Muslims are no different. You have to understand it like everyone else. They'll be open to being attacked. They have to also protect themselves. That's how everybody did it. It's not like today where you can enter into a, a world convention or a, some kind of a, a, a universal, uh, what's it called? Uh, there, there are new laws that come in place and they invite countries to be um, signatories to it. I mean, if there's alternatives for peace, then fine. But in those days, they didn't have that. My brothers and sisters in Islam, what happened? Rasul sent these letters to these different emperors and kings. Some of them accepted Islam. Some of them didn't accept, nor did they reject. So they offered a peace treaty. And some of them, they were open enemies. They called for war. The ones who accepted, some of them are Abyssinia, Ethiopia and Najashi. Negus who accepted Islam. The other one was the other one. Th there were others. They were mainly from outside of Arabia. As I said, Khuza'a accepted, and there were other Arabian tribes and sub-Arabian tribes outside. You don't need to know their names because the names are forgotten now. The other one who embraced Islam was the ruler of Yemen under the rule of Persia. This ruler of Yemen was a Persian man. He was a great king. And he was a nephew of the Persian emperor in Persia. Because this was the biggest superpower. And this man, his name was Badan. If you remember 15 lessons ago, I talked about him. Badan took over Yemen and he was the ruler. The Persian emperor made him the ruler there. The Prophet ﷺ sent a letter to him inviting him to Islam. And Badan at first didn't, wasn't hostile, but he also didn't accept Islam. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, sent a message to him, saying to him, if you think that your Persian emperor is going to harm you, if you do embrace Islam, because he felt Badan was a man of intelligence, then know that your Persian emperor, your uncle, has died. The Persian emperor has died. And you know, it takes three months to get that news. How could this messenger come with a letter from the Prophet ﷺ three months earlier before his king uncle dies and tells him your uncle is dead? He had died three days before the messenger got there. It's impossible for anyone to know this. Badan goes, hold on, let me find out. He sends his messengers. They go for about nearly a month to get to Persia and he finds out that his uncle was dead on this particular day, three days before the letter got to him. Exactly as the, the date, the time that the Prophet ﷺ told him he will die. Or he has died. He said he died three days ago. And the letter was sent three months ago. He arrives in, in Yemen. He gets the letter. Badan reads it. And he, the letter says three days ago. Well, how did the Prophet ﷺ know this? Jibreel ﷺ. When he found out, Badan says, No man can know this information except a prophet from God. He must be a prophet. And so he embraces Islam. And all of Yemen now is Muslim. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he used to make dua for the people of Yemen. He used to say things like, hum They have the softest of hearts and the most easy going of, of, of approach. And you still till today, you go to the Yemenis and you find that the Yemenis have a very soft and kind approach. He used to make dua for the Yemenis. Oh Allah, bless our Sham and bless our Yemen. So it's a special place here. As for the, the emperor of Persia, he was... Uh, he was, he was very bad. Prophet ﷺ sent the letter. The messenger gets to him. And what does he do with it? He reads it. From Muhammad the messenger, the, the messenger says, From Muhammad the messenger of God to the great emperor of Persia. Before he can even continue the words, the emperor of Persia got so angry, furious. He says, 
me, the great emperor of Persia, he puts his name before mine in the letter. My name should be before his. He should say to the great emperor from Muhammad. But no, he said from Muhammad, this messenger of God to the great emperor. He grabs the letter, rips it and steps on it. The news gets to the Prophet ﷺ from the Messenger and the Prophet peace be upon him made a dua against him. He said, may Allah rip your kingdom apart as you have ripped this. This is, a, this is uncalled for. You never, you never rip a Messenger's message. You don't harm the Messenger. Everybody knew this. And SubhanAllah, the Emperor dies and Prophet ﷺ sends that letter. The letter reaches the Yemen person and truly the Persian kingdom was ripped apart by the Muslims later on, by the Muslims themselves. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi is an interesting one. He sent a letter to a people in, the, in Egypt. They were called the Copts or the Coptics. Ever heard of the Copts? Till today they exist there. The Coptics are Christians. Well, they, they don't belong to Rome. They're just Egyptians. They've been living there for centuries and centuries in Egypt. Allah <coughs> from where? But they're a very ancient civilization, the Copt, Coptics. They are Christian belief. And the Prophet ﷺ acknowledged their presence in Egypt. He sends a letter to the emperor or the, the ruler of the Copts. His name was Al-Muqawqis. Al-Muqawqis. It was under the rule of Rome. And the Prophet ﷺ did the same as he did with the other rulers. And this particular man, al muqal this intelligent man, he was impressed by the letter. He liked the letter from the Prophet ﷺ. And he, he, he was very impressed that the king of uh, Ethiopia had embraced Islam. He was very impressed that the king of Yemen had embraced Islam. And all he did was this. He asked the messenger, the Prophet's companion who went there. I think his name was Hatib anhu. He says to him, if he is the messenger of God, and this is what his people did to him, then why couldn't he ask God to destroy his people or to do something to them? You know, if he's the messenger of God. And the messenger, the, the Hatib who says to an Muqawqis, this ruler of Egypt, the Coptic, he says to him, you believe in Jesus Christ? He says, yes. He says, I can ask you the same question. Why didn't Jesus Christ ask God to destroy his people for what they did to him, the children of Israel, the Jews? And that's when he understood he didn't do it because a prophet is a mercy to his people. He doesn't make du'a like that against his people. And that's when he said, fair enough. Now, he didn't embrace Islam because he was afraid of his people and the Romans. Instead, he says to the messenger, he says, go back to your prophet. And I, I have always known that a prophet is going to come out in a sham. I didn't know from Arabia. So I kind of believe, but I can't embrace Islam. But take these gifts with you. This is very interesting. He took with him some gifts from the king. This was a very normal thing. They used to do that between rulers. He sent with him a mule, a mule like a donkey, but one of the mules from the king. And he sent with him another animal, a donkey, a donkey and a mule as a present. It's, it's a very normal thing. It's a very prestigious actually. He sent him a couple of garments. And on these garments, they saw the Prophet ﷺ wearing them. And some of them had a little bit of silk in them, a little bit of silk lining in them. Yet the Prophet ﷺ wore it. And this is interesting to know from a fiqh perspective. That the Prophet ﷺ once took up, he held gold in his hand and he held silk in his hand. Silk material, silk. You know, silk, hari, and gold. And he said to his companions, these two have been forbidden upon the men of my ummah. Men are not allowed. The men who have reached puberty, males who have reached puberty, men, they cannot wear gold on their skin or silk. But it is halal for the women of my ummah. But here the Prophet ﷺ is wearing a garment with a bit of silk on it. And what this is evidence that you're allowed to wear something with a bit of silk on it or wear something that has a bit of gold in it. But you're not allowed to have full gold or full silk. You might wear a tie, for example, that has a bit of silk in it. A shirt that has, a little, that has a silk pocket, for example, or silk lining. That's okay. You wear a piece of a ring, for example, that has a little bit of gold in it. That's fine. But to take it all as gold, all as silk, that's haram. 
He also sent with him another gift. Two slave women. They call them concubines. A concubine is someone, a woman usually, who in the olden days, maybe still exists now in some parts of the world where there's extreme war. When the war happens and you conquer a land, there are women and children who become uh, the captives of war. They've got no home, no place. So the Muslims, what they do is they take them into their care. And the way they have to take them into their care, in those days especially, was either as slaves and they're owned by masters so that they don't become public property. So that they do not become public property. I know it's very hard for you to understand because we're living in Australia. What do we know? We're inside of a box. All we watch is channel 9, 7 and 10. And that's about it, commercials. And we think the whole world runs that way. Brothers and sisters, think again, man. The world is like a whole different planet to, to Australia. If you're from America, you have no idea what's going on outside the world. But it's a total different world out there. And if you study history, you will see that the world is nothing like today. So that's why some people ask these questions, because they don't know the history well. So concubinage was very normal. Slavery was very normal. Islam accepted slavery and concubinage. But... What it did was it placed rules that was never existing. They have to treat them like their own family. They have to feed them what they feed their own family. They have to clothe them like that. They have to treat them like their own brothers and sisters. They have to be kind to them. They have, and if they can work themselves to free themselves, they can. And so on. You know, some Rasulullah used to make some of them rulers or commanders of a whole army and they were slaves. Yet the Prophet lifted their status. So this was unprecedented. You can't slap a slave. You can't harm a concubine. You can't do anything like that. And what a concubine was, was women who were captives of war, uh, they were um, casualties of war. And what used to happen was that different kings and emperors and Rome, all around the world and soldiers and people used to have them. And they had no other option, these women. That's the only way they could survive. So they used to, they used to settle with it and accept it. So this man, this king, he had two concubines. Their names were Maria and Shireen. Maria and her sister Shireen. It's a famous name, Maria al Qutiyya. Maria the Coptic. She was a Christian. And the king gave them to, as a gift to the Prophet. ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ received them from Hatib, who was the messenger. On the way, Hatib made da'wah, invitation to these two women, and they embraced Islam. Maria al Qutiyya radiallahu anha and Shireen radiallahu anha, they accepted Islam. Shireen went and became a concubine to another companion of Hassan ibn Thabit. And by the way, if you go back to those days, they accepted this. Even his women accepted it and they lived happily with them. Not like today. You can't have a concubine today, man. You can't. You know, having just one wife these days, it's, it's, it's hard. <laughs> having a concubine, it's un, unmeasurable. You can't. That doesn't exist right now. But it used to exist then and in some parts of the world today. So this woman, Maria al Qutiyya, however, she accepted to be Rasulullah's concubine. And what concubine means that she has a high status, almost like a wife, but not quite. But she's not less than that. So she has a status almost like a wife. Therefore, the correct opinion is that Maria al-Qutiyah was not one of the mothers of the believers. But she was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And uh, she embraced Islam. She loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she was honorable, valued. She was beautiful. And Allah gave him a child from her. His name was Ibrahim. Rasulullah ﷺ never had any boys, children. In fact, never had any children except from Khadija radiallahu anha. And he had two boys from Khadija radiallahu anha, four girls. But the boys all died. The four girls survived. Ruqayya, Zainab, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima radiallahu anha ajma'in, anhunna. And then Allah gave him Ibrahim, a boy from Mary al -Qubtiyya. The Prophet ﷺ loved him so much. But by the age of 18 months, Ibrahim struck a disease and he died. The Prophet ﷺ, he's the one who named him Ibrahim. When he was born, he says, I want to name him by my father's name. His father's name, Ibrahim ﷺ. He is the great, great, great grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. So he named him Ibrahim out of love for his great, 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 great grandfather, Ibrahim ﷺ. He died at the age of 12, 18 months. SubhanAllah. Rasul ﷺ, and out of love for Mary al Qutiyya and out of love for his son, he said, If Allah had made my son live, I would release all of his uncles. His uncles, meaning his wife's, uh, Mary al Qutiyya's uh, brothers, uh, I think they were captives uh, somehow. But what he said, he said this, and he also said, There is a lineage between us and the Egyptians, the Coptics of Egypt. 
right? So be kind to them and treat them well. He used to tell his companions, treat them well and be kind to them. They are related to us, the Egyptians, from Ibrahim alayhi salam side and from Hajar alayhi salam side. That's how the Prophet was And when he married, when he not married, when he took Mary al Qutiya as his concubine, in those days, as I told you, it was legitimate and was acceptable universally, then he also gave kindness to the Egyptians because of her as well. So he created that harmony. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when Ibrahim died, his son, the Prophet ﷺ went and buried him in Al-Baqiyah. And he cried, ﷺ. As he was burying him, he carried him, ﷺ, and he said to him, uh, the eyes tear and the hearts are saddened to your loss of Ibrahim. Obviously, Ibrahim can't hear him, but it's just a metaphor. It's a rhetoric question, rhetorical sort of statement. You say that, you're allowed to say that. And he said, but the words, the tongue does not say anything except what pleases Allah. And this is the common thing. This is the sharia, that if somebody passes away, you can cry. You can say words of remembrance, but you do not slap yourself or tear your hair or tear your clothing or say words that are blasphemous, that are against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why, ya Allah, did you do that? What have I ever done? This is the choice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's a test of your faith, subhanAllah. So my brothers and sisters, he buried Ibrahim and he threw some dust over him. That was the first time the companions saw him throw soil over it and it becomes a sunnah now to throw soil over a person that you've buried and walked away. One little incident happened which I think is worth mentioning here to you. When they went to bury the Prophet's son, coincidentally, coincidence, science, science and the way the solar system works, there was a lunar eclipse. There was a lunar eclipse. You know what a lunar eclipse is, right? It's when what? When the moon goes in front of the sun. Okay, and it's rotation. So what happened was that there was a lunar eclipse. The sun was eclipsed. And some people, some of the companions who still had, were still learning about Islam, they still had the mind of Jahiliya, who did still kind of think of superstitions, superstitious beliefs. They said the sun was eclipsed to the death of the Prophet's son. Uh, this is a problem now. If the Prophet ﷺ had not addressed this and let it go, today we will find people maybe calling his son a prophet or even worshipping him. Or worshipping the sun. Or calling the eclipse as a miracle that is attached and probably would have made an anniversary for it and a kind of Eid and a type of worship causing shirk. That's why in Islam, superstitions are forbidden. Rasulullah ﷺ, he forbid superstitions. He forbid uh, tarot reading. He forbid palm reading. He forbid people who believe in amulets and things like that that you hang around your neck. Uh, the blue eye and I don't know what and the, the rabbit's foot and knocking on wood and uh, throwing salt behind your back or good luck and bad luck stuff all this is rejected by Islam there are no superstitions in Islam we have no superstition we have optimism optimistic but we don't have superstition we don't have pessimism we have optimism but no pessimism and we have no superstition superstitious beliefs are a form of shirk they're a minor form of shirk which lead to a large form of shirk Anyone who goes to a fortune teller to tell them things that only Allah knows and believes what they say has become a disbeliever. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Authentic hadith. And whoever goes to a fortune teller but does not believe what they say but just listens out of interest, 40 days of their prayer will not be accepted. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Why? Because you are promoting and giving value to these people to continue their work. But if you want to learn about them in order to warn people from them, like you read about what horoscopes are about and what fortune telling about, in order to teach people to stay away from it, then that's okay. For pure knowledge in order to warn people or to learn it yourself so you don't fall into it. Brothers and sisters in Islam, we move on. Rasulullah addressed this and he said, the sun has only eclipsed because of natural occurrences. He even said the word natural occurrences. It is the law of Allah in the universe that the sun has eclipsed. Panel Rasulullah is talking pure science here. Pure science. And that's why I tell a lot of my brothers and sisters, especially as a teacher, we teach the students. There's not much contradiction. In fact, Islam and science are separate. You can't use science to prove Islam. And you don't use Islam to prove science. Science is a separate study. You certainly can't use science to prove God. The moment you use science to prove God, is the moment that you disprove God. Because Allah cannot be proven by science. 
You can use science, the system of science, and how science works to say, SubhanAllah, there is an order, there is a system, there is a cause and effect. This cannot happen without a designer. Science is a design itself. So you can use science to show you that Allah exists by the, by the way science is. When you discover how the world works and how it always works in an order, an order cannot happen without a designer. And a designer has to be infinitely intelligent to create all of this. Otherwise, it would be all haphazard all over the place. The laws of the universe, the laws of cause and effect, the laws of um, order, the laws of all of this stuff, right? But Rasulullah is saying, these are the laws Allah has written in the world. It's a normal natural occurrence. It has nothing to do. Like one person, he may be walking on a footpath. He sees a girl across the road. He says, oh my God, my heart dropped. Who is that girl? Who is that girl? She passes by and he can never forget her. So he pauses. He's hypnotized. After she goes, he comes to walk, looks down at the floor and finds a 20 cent coin under his foot. So he picks up this 20 cent coin and says, this is my good luck. Good luck, channel. And he keeps his 20 cent coin forever. Right? <laughs> Maybe goes and marries that woman, let's say. And every time they have a fight, for example, he says, damn, I didn't have my 20 cent coin. I left it on, at home. That's why I had a fight. So he starts believing the 20 cent coin has some kind of powers. This is how it all begins, brothers and sisters. You find people who've got absolute common sense, they come and believe in stuff like that. A bird flew. A bird pooed. <laughs> a bird died. A car went past. The breeze went past. Ah, oh, good sign. We believe in good signs. A, a breeze passed, we say, this is a good sign. But what I mean is that they attach their heart to it and say, this is an omen for that. Right? Such as people who hold like a string and say, this is my good luck string, or my good luck charm, or my good luck whatever. A stone or something like that. This is not allowed in Islam. Anyway, brothers and sisters in Islam, what happened next? Rasulullah then sent a letter to Heraclius, the emperor of Rome, the Christian. Heraclius liked the message. And he was almost about to believe. But he said, I fear my people. So... What happened to the king of uh, Rome? He just said, look, you know, this man, he's, he's, a, he's a trustworthy man and these are signs of prophethood. He said that to him, to the messenger. He said his people have kicked him out. Then people have followed him. He has received a book, words from God. His character is such and such. He accepts gifts but will not accept charity. He's got the seal of prophethood behind his neck, between his shoulder blades. This Heraclius guy knew about Christianity. So he said he must be a prophet. But he refused to embrace Islam. So he had kind of a heart for it. But subhanAllah, you'll see later on that he still fought the Prophet ﷺ. In this time, my brothers and sisters, someone embraces Islam, who brings glory and might to the Muslims till the end of time. His name is Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu has never lost a battle in his life. An amazing tactician in war, very smart, very cunning, very intelligent in warfare, and very smart in normal life. Extremely strong, tall, broad-shouldered, broad-chested, he used to be able, he and az Zubayr, they were the only two companions who used to fight with two swords at once and on their feet. They never rode a horse and fought. They rode a horse, but they always used to get off their horse before they would fight. They would always fight on their feet with two swords and no shield. Him and az Zubayr, they were the only companions, warriors that did this. And if he was on his horse, some companions said, we used to see Khalid Walid never fighting while sitting on his horse. One time we saw him on his horse, but he was standing. Standing on his horse <laughs> while fighting with two swords. <laughs> then he'd jump off it and he'd fight with it. Khalid Walid is something out of this world. And the, when he died, عنه, there is a famous statement that poems, poets said and women said, they said, no mother will ever give birth to the likes of Khalid ibn Walid after him. Truly. And Rasulullah called him Sayfullah al-Maslul, the unsheathed 
sword of Allah. If you're going to face him in a battle, you've got no hope with him. He will never lose a battle. And the sword of Allah can never be broken. So Khalid ibn Walid could never be defeated. That's why Khalid ibn Walid never died in a battle. He fought more than 70 battles. He had more than 70 wounds in his chest with not one on his back. Which means he never turned his back on the enemy. Always at the front. And when he came to his deathbed, he said, Here I am. I have fought him more in every battle with the Muhammad Sallallahu after my embrace Islam. In every battle that Islam has ever been in. And here I am. Every opportunity for me to die and death did not come to me. I wished for martyrdom and it never came to, to me. I wished for death and it never came to me. I put myself in the face of death and it never came to me. And here I am dying. Here I am dying. Like, just like a pathetic male camel. You know, like a ba'ib. Sick, like every other, like a camel, an animal dying on my deathbed. That's how he hated it so much. That he really was afraid he wanted to die in battle. That was his dream. But he died out of sickness, he says, like a, like a male camel. لا نامت عين الجبناء. It says, may the eyes of the cowards never sleep. You know, I, every battle I was in, I never died. They're afraid of death and I was in every battle. May the eyes of the cowards never sleep. My brothers and sisters, but he is, he is special because the Prophet ﷺ named him the sword of Allah. And if he were to die in a battle, what is he saying about the sword of Allah? The sword of Allah gets broken. So Allah refused for Khalid Walid his sword to die in a battle. No one can defeat him. The way he embraces Islam, number one, he couldn't memorize Quran very well. They said that he only knew about seven surahs to ten surahs. Some said 17 surahs. So for the people who don't know more than 10 or 17 or 20 surahs, you know, at least you're doing other good work. Alhamdulillah, not everybody has to memorize the Quran. That's fine. Khalid Walid only knew about 17 surahs and they were the small ones. That's all. He wasn't good at memorizing but he was amazing in, in what he did best. And that is warfare and battles and tactician and uh, tactics. And that's how, they, that's how he, he brought glory to Islam, actually. My brothers and sisters in Islam. Actually, can I ask one of you to switch on that light? The light's behind me. Can you, can you grab, just switch on the top light on the Ayyad that Jazakallah khair. There you go. Now it's proof that, I, that my nur does not shine the place. <laughs> I don't have it. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us all in nur, ya Rabbil Alam. Brothers and sisters in Islam. Khalid bin Walid says, I heard about the surah that was in Surah Al-Muddathir, speaking about my father. I shall put him in hellfire. And it described him. He sweat and he said, it's my father. He goes, Islam was always in my mind. But I always used to avoid the Muslims. I'd go up to the mountains when they came to do Umrah and I didn't want to see them. But then I thought to myself, should I leave and go and join with the Persians or the Romans? But then I would have to embrace their religion. No, I can't leave the religion of my forefathers. Should I leave to Abyssinia, the Ethiopians? But then I'll have to have become a Christian. But hold on a minute. Najashi, he had embraced Islam. How can I go there? He goes, I was in confusion. I didn't know where to go. And I knew after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, after the Prophet ﷺ signed the peace treaty, I knew Khalid Marid was the only one who could understand out of all the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, even while he was still a non-Muslim, that this peace treaty was going to give the Prophet ﷺ inevitable victory. All the other companions didn't know, but he was the only one who understood. He said that peace treaty is going to give him inevitably a peace treaty. And he said to one of his companions, he said, a fox, if he hides inside of his hole and you put water in the hole, what happens to the fox? You wait, you wait, wait. eventually you flood him out and he's going to come out. And that's what the Muhammad is doing to us right now. That peace treaty is the water in our in the hole. And we are just like foxes waiting for us to come out. Khad Mualid was that much of an intelligent man. So he comes up to one of his companions, Safwan, says, you know, embrace Islam with me. Let's go to Muhammad. You know, he's going to take over the Arabs. He's going to do this. Let's share with him. And Safwan goes, what? He killed my father. How dare you? I will not. Even if all Arabia embraces Islam, I will not embrace. So then he goes to Ikrimah, whose father was Abu Jahl. He goes, what? My father was killed. I want to kill Muhammad. So he goes to another friend of his name, Uthman. Anhu, another Uthman, not Uthman, but Uthman, another guy, and he says, let's embrace Islam together. And this guy, Uthman, had his father and four brothers killed in the Battle of Badr. Yet, he says, you know what, you're right, Islam has entered my heart. And the person who made Islam enter into Khalid Walid's heart was his brother. He sent him a letter and says, Muhammad says, he asked me about you. He says, what's Khalid doing? 
He is such an intelligent man that it does not befit him to remain a non-Muslim except to understand and know that Islam is the truth. He knows it, but he's refusing to enter it. Why? Wallahi, if he were to enter it, I will make him the commander of everything. I will give him a status that no one else has because he deserves it. He's that much of an important man. When he received that letter, when it says, I then knew that something happened to me. Muhammad mentioning me, giving me value. He recognizes and I do agree. He, he's truthful. So he, he goes, Islam entered my heart. I took this friend of mine, Uthman. I went all the way to Medina. And there he saw Amr ibn al-As who had already embraced Islam. But he was coming back from Ethiopia. He says, you've come to embrace Islam? He says, yes, to join you with Uthman. As they were entering, I think Ali radiallahu anhu or Umar, the others, they saw him. And they said, Muhammad sallallahu is waiting for you. His brother, sorry. He says, Muhammad sallallahu is waiting for you. Khalid Marid goes, I went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I saw him at a distance. And wallahi, all I saw was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the most massive smile on his face. He kept smiling to me until I reached him. And his smile would not leave. And he said, what have you come for, ya Khalid? He said, I've come to say... And then he said it, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ hugged him very tightly. And he said to him, sit down next to me. And he got really close to him and said, Ya Khalid, I always knew that you would embrace Islam. It was just a matter of time because you are an intelligent person. And only really intelligent people know that Islam is the truth. So Alhamdulillah Khad Wali that embraced Islam. Not even five months later, the Prophet ﷺ makes him a commander of one of the arms. And this is how it happened. The next battle that happened now is called the Battle of Mu'tah against the Romans. And another people called the Ghassasina. Ghassasina was an Arab tribe that was under Rome. What happened? The Prophet ﷺ sent a letter to the king of the Ghassasina people who were under the Roman in Asham in Greater Syria. And he refused. He also ripped the paper up and the Prophet ﷺ made a dua against him. So what happened? The Ro- he sent a letter to the king of Rome, Heraclius, and Heraclius sent him 100,000 soldiers. And the assassins, there were also 100,000 soldiers, including 50,000 horsemen, warriors. The Muslims had no horsemen, only a few. So 200,000 soldiers mixed with the Ghassasina Arabs and the Romans met to go and fight the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ prepared an army of 3,000 soldiers. 3,000. Now the story is so beautiful here. The Muslims had never had that amount of army soldiers before. 3,000 soldiers, oof, huge, massive. And they set out. Among them was uh, Abu Bakr anhu, Umar, Khalid ibn Walid. All the great companions were with them. Ali radiallahu anhu, they were all with them. So the Prophet ﷺ gathered them and he said to them, Your commander is Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha is the formerly adopted son of the Prophet. Zayd said, He is your commander. If he is slain, if he's killed, then let Ja'far ibn Abi Talib be the next commander after him. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib is the Prophet's first cousin. Loves him so much. He said, If Ja'far is killed, then appoint Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Radiallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Rawaha is from the Ansar. As for Zayd and Jafar, they're from the Meccan, the Muhajirun. So they're more closely related to the Prophet. As for Abdullah ibn Rawaha, it's from the Ansar, a bit of a distance. And then the Prophet went silent. He didn't say who after Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And they set out on a Friday, Jumu'ah. On their way, they settled somewhere. And Ja'far ibn Abi Talib thought, you know, instead of praying Jumu'ah with them here, I'd like to go and get the rewards with Muhammad sallallahu So he kind of thought, wait here. He went back a few kilometers and he went to the Prophet sallallahu to pray Jama'ah with them for Jumu'ah prayer. When he finished, the Prophet sallallahu looked and saw Ja'far there. He goes, what, why have you come back? He goes, I'm going back here, Rasulullah, but I wanted to get the rewards of Jumu'ah with you in your masjid. So the Prophet sallallahu said to him, Ya Ja'far, Wallahi, if you were to donate... The amount of the world, it will never equal the rewards of you being with your companions on that journey on jihad. This jum, jum, who told you that this jama'ah jum'ah with me in my masjid on a jum'ah is better than what you are on? That's the value of what he was on to go and fight. Fisa billah in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So Jafar cried, and the Prophet ﷺ asked him, Why are you crying? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I fear the fire. Can you ask Allah to gift me with martyrdom, shahada, on this journey? So he made dua for him. And so he left. Jafar Dilana went with him. On their way, they reached a place where they found out there were 200,000 soldiers, meant 3,000 soldiers of Muslims, against how many? 200,000 Roman Gassassin, if you like to call them, people, with 50,000 horsemen. They can't bid up. How is 3,000 going to be 200,000 warriors? But subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa put the fear in the hearts of the enemy. They had heard news about the companions, especially the Romans. They started hearing about these companions, that they are special people. They've got special genes. To the point where the emperor of, of Rome, after the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, he had captured a number of Muslims and among them were Abdullah ibn Hudhafa. And he used to ask, is there any companions among them? Because they, were, they had almost died out. And he said one day, yes, Abdullah ibn Hudhafa is there. And he said to him, I'll give you half of my kingdom and you can marry my daughter if you convert to Christianity. Why? Because he wanted him to marry his daughter because they had this belief that they had this special gene that he wants to marry his daughter and produce children who have the genes of the companions so he can conquer the world for him. That's what they thought the companions were. They became legends, these companions. And obviously he refused. And there's a long story to that. Maybe one day we'll come to it. Anyway, the Romans had this idea about these companions. Who was with these companions as well? Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. Khalid ibn Walid was not a commander. He was just with them. So they reached this place and they reached this town which had narrow streets and buildings. So they asked the people to leave the town. No, we don't want any innocent people to, to die. But this was a strategic place which Zayd and the companions, they got together in this particular place. And they turned it into a mosque and they prayed in it. Today they call it the Mosque of Khalid ibn Walid. And you can still see it there. The Mosque of Mu'ta, when they went to Mu'ta. Mu'ta is a place, that town's called Mu'ta. And that's where they faced the enemies of the Romans, the Christians, and the Arabs under the Christians. They prayed there and they started to seek counsel. They said, we'll fight in this town because it's a narrow place. 200,000 soldiers will find it difficult to fight us here. But we're only 3,000, we can maneuver around. And so they met the Romans there. When the Romans arrived, the Muslims, and the Romans, it was night, so they slept. They didn't fight at night. And then at Fajr time, the Muslims used to pray Fajr. The Christians didn't pray Fajr. So the Muslims would come out of Fajr at about 3.30 a.m. And they would surprise the Romans by attacking them. The first Fajr, they surprised them in their tents and they killed hundreds of them. Then they returned. The Romans thought, what is 3,000 soldiers killing our soldiers away? And we're not killing not one of them. So they started getting afraid. The next Fajr, the 3,000 soldiers, all 3,000 came out, killed another few hundred of them. They increased to a few thousand. The Romans started getting scared. Fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. More of them are dying out. They said, what is happening here? And so the Romans found out that these Muslims were, 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 were strategic. They were using Fajr time, which we don't wake up on, they said. So we're going to prepare the night before and wake up for Fajr before them. And so on the seventh day, Zayd radiallahu anhu took his army and found the Romans prepared for them. They fought tremendously. And obviously they were very strong. 3,000 were almost equal to about, about half of their army, 100,000. That's how they felt they were. But unfortunately, they weren't strong enough. At this point, what happened? The Prophet is still in Medina. He gathered the Muslims in the masjid. And whatever people could gather around him. And Jibreel السلام, would make the Prophet see what's happening. So it was like watching TV or watching the internet live coverage. Live coverage through Jibreel alayhi salam. The Prophet alayhi salam started telling them, this is now happening and this is now happening. And so he reached the point in Zayd on the seventh day, he has grabbed the flag. He's heading towards them. Oh no, Zayd is attacked. A group of them have surrounded him. And what did they do? Oh no, they killed Zayd radiallahu anhu. And the flag fell. Zayd radiallahu anhu was attacked and he was killed. The flag fell. Zayd is killed. Zayd is martyred. I can see him in Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ started to cry. Then, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib 
carries the flag. The commander of the Prophet Remember he said, if Zayd dies, who gets it? Ja'far radiallahu anhu. Ja'far radiallahu anhu grabs the, the flag. He gets off his horse and he starts to fight on his feet. The Roman soldiers reach Ja'far and they chop off his right arm. The flag falls. He grabs it with his left arm. They chop off his left arm. The flag falls and Ja'far grabs it with half of his arms that was left. And they began to stab and cut Ja'far radiallahu anhu so much until they ripped him into two pieces. They cut him into two halves. And he was two pieces, Ja'far radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is describing this and he says, Ja'far is martyred. I can see him now. Allah has given him two wings in exchange for the arms which he lost. Wings made of pearls. And he is flying in Jannah. And so he had the nickname Ja'far, the flying man of Jannah. Yeah. And he keeps these flying wings made of pearls until the day of judgment. When they came to get the body of, 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 of Ja'far, they noticed that where half of his body, it was stabbed with over 80 wounds before he died. He was a very courageous warrior. For Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cried for his cousin, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu Next, Abdullah ibn Rawah, the Ansar person. He knew that he now has to grab the flag. But he was from the Ansar. And the Ansar people, they were sitting, listening to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember what I told you, live coverage. And then they got nervous. They go, oh no. He's from the Ansar. And you know, the Ansar still don't have that connection like the Muhajirs. So they feared he might hesitate. And truly, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, he looks up and he got a little bit scared. He said, how can I hold the flag? He hesitated a little bit. So Abdullah ibn Rawaha stood up and he started making poetry against himself. Like he put himself into two people as if he's talking to himself. And he started telling himself, saying, Oh, pathetic soul, how could you be cowardly right now? Do you not want Jannah? Are you now a coward? Get up, you, you, know, you stinking person. Start fighting. And he started to really like abuse himself and motivate himself. Until he got himself to grab the flag and he charged in radiallahu anhu as well. He attacks the Romans and the Romans attacked him and he was killed as well. The Prophet ﷺ said, Abdullah ibn Rawaha is a martyr and I can see him. He is reclining on silk and gold in Jannah but a distance away from Zayd and Jafar. Why a distance away? Because he said he hesitated a little bit. SubhanAllah, everybody receives the reward according exactly to what they did. He hesitated, so he's not at the level of Ja'far radiallahu anhu or Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. Now the flag is on the floor. There is no commander. The Prophet ﷺ didn't give a fourth commander. What are they to do? The Muslims started to fall apart. They retreated and went back. And it was nightfall. And a great warrior, he didn't want this to end. So he goes and grabs the flag. His name was Thabit radiallahu anhu. And he had embraced Islam a long time before Khalid ibn Walid. What does he do? He grabs the flag and heads off to Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. And he says to him, Ya Khalid, take the flag and lead the army. And Khalid said to him, But you are more valuable than me. You are older in Islam than me. I, don't, I, don't, I am not worthy of holding the flag. And Thabit said to him, Yes, I may be older than you in Islam, but you are more qualified than me for this mission. And what does this teach us? It teaches us that in, our, in Islam, in our positions, no matter what community organization we have, what project we have, the Prophet ﷺ taught us and his companions to also always look for the person who is most qualified for the position, not the one who is most valued. We don't give positions to people who are more prestigious because they have a good name or they're popular or for their looks or for their wealth or for their name we look for the one who's most qualified even if they are the not most prestigious in the community that's how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with his companions and truly Thabit understood this Abu Bakr was with them Umar was with them but no Khalid bin Walid is the most qualified for this position and the Prophet ﷺ knew that Khalid bin Walid will be the fourth commander he actually knew that but why did he stay silent because if he had told him give it to Khalid ibn Walid, 
they would have said exactly that. We have the most prestigious of Sahabas with us. And you want to give it to this man who's only been four or four months? And he is the, he is the reason why in the battle of Uhud your uncle Hamza died. He was the reason why we were defeated in the battle of Uhud. If the Prophet ﷺ had said that, they would have obeyed the Prophet ﷺ, but with hesitation. So what did he do? He left it for their judgment, for them to choose it among themselves. And after they had seen what had happened to the three companions before them. So they all called out. So they went into that council place, that little mosque. And what happened? Thabit said, I've given it to Khalid bin Walid. What do you think? And all the 3,000 companions called out with one voice. Khalid bin Walid, no other. And they all elected Khalid bin Walid. And so they fought with courage with him. Khalid bin Walid, what did he do? He sat down that night thinking what tactics should we use. And this is what he did. This is where Khalid bin Walid's tactics come in. What he did was, he rearranged the entire army. The right plank, he put him in the left plank. The left plank, he put him in the right plank. The ones at the front, he put him at the back. The ones at the back, he put him at the front. And the ones at the back, he said to them, I want you to walk away towards Medina until we cannot see you. Keep walking until no one can see you. No enemy, nothing. And wait for my command. There is a signal, I'll send someone to you to come in. What is he doing? The next day, they went to face the Romans. And what did the Romans expect? They expected the same faces, the same structure. But what did they see? Different faces, different structure. The right was in somewhere else. There were new faces, there were new structure. What did they think? They thought that they had brought another army, a support. Double their amount. They go, we're having a hard enough time with 3,000. Now there's 6,000. But in fact, there was still the same army, subhanAllah. And then suddenly, as they were fighting, Khalid Walid sends a messenger to the other few, well, only a few hundred, to come in. And the Romans saw them galloping on their horses with dust and they said, Oh my God, we don't even know how many they are. Another reinforcement coming from Medina? More? And so they got really scared. But what Khalid Walid was doing is a chess game. It's just really, it was just a bluff. Yet it worked. And that's how what Khalid Walid was so smart about. So when they saw this, the Muslims were almost about to defeat but about to destroy their commander and make the Roman flag fall, the Byzantine flag fall. As Khan Walid approached and was about to kill the commander, Khan Walid obviously is fighting with two swords on his feet, and everybody seeing Khan Walid, the Romans, they're avoiding him. No one wants to be around him. They go, every time someone approaches this man, they die. Like he killed in the hundreds, just by himself. And so he reached the flag. The commander is looking, the person who's holding the flag is looking at him with open eyes, thinking, I'm finished. The Romans thinking it's over. And then suddenly Khalid bin Walid does something that was unprecedented. He retreats and tells the whole army, retreat, stop. And truly they went back. And what happens to the Romans? They said, don't believe him, man. This is a trick. This is a trick. He's going to do something. So let's all just stay here and wait. Don't you dare retreat. Don't you dare go away. Don't you dare go after him. If you go after him, it's a trap. And what did Khalid bin Walid do? There was no trap. He just used this opportunity because he thought, we're not going to be able to beat this army. Even if we made their flags fall, they're going to realize we're only a small amount and they're going to kill us. So how can I save these companions? I don't want a single life being lost. And this is not a war that we can win. So we need to retreat. But how can I do it without them realizing that we're a small army? Because then they'll come and massacre us all. He did this trick and then retreated right at the point where the Romans thought they're going to win. And he retreated to make them think that they were setting up a trap for them. So what did the Romans do? They stayed where they are, waiting, waiting, waiting. Not able to retreat, not able to advance. Khan Walid in the meantime takes the army and goes back all the way back to Medina. They go all the way back to their homes and they sit comfortably. And the Romans are waiting. They realize there's no army. So what the heck has happened here? They didn't know where to go. They retreated. It's four months journey to get to Medina. When Khan Walid arrives in Medina, the people of Medina didn't like what they saw. They said, you people are the retreaters. You're cowards. You couldn't win. You couldn't do anything. You're not brave. And Khad Walid and the army, they started to feel bullied. You know, they were hurt at this. So the Prophet ﷺ stood up and he broke this um, rumor. He said, La wallahi, they are not retreaters. They are repeaters. See, Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us, he says in the Quran, do not retreat unless you are going to plan to repeat. And do not retreat until 
If you are half their army, if you are half their amount, you're not allowed to retreat. But there were 3,000 against 200,000. That's nowhere near even, you know, a third of them. And they had to retreat. So Rasulullah said, no, 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 this is karma. This is a smart way of returning back. The, what happened was that the Romans and all the other Arabs, they thought these people are very strong. You can't just face them. 3,000 against 200. They, they stood up against 200,000. They're not a simple army to mess with. No horses, none of that stuff. And so it was, inshallah, a victory in a different way. So that was the story of Khalid Walid. And after that day, Khalid Walid becomes the greatest commander ever to exist in the history after the Prophet Muhammad After that, brothers and sisters, what happened? I just want to mention a very quick incident which is quite interesting to know what happened there. There was a man by the name of Amr ibn al-As. Remember, he embraced Islam. He had only been about six months a Muslim. Amr ibn al-As was known to be... Muslims liked him, they respected him, but not too much because he used to work against the Prophet So what happened with Amr ibn al-As? He had embraced Islam and there was a little... There was a little um, tribe that was with the Romans still, and the Muslims had to take care of them. They were called Banu Sa'ad. So he told Amr ibn al-As, Prophet ﷺ said to Amr ibn al-As, says, I want you to be the commander of this army, and I'm going to send with you 300 soldiers against that tribe, because they are a threat. Go get them before they get us. So Amr ibn al-As looks at him and says, Ya Rasulullah, I did, you know, me out of all people. And Prophet ﷺ to encourage him, he said, listen, you go and you get two rewards. The reward of the hereafter and I will give you from the spoils of the war. I will give you a lot more. Just for leading the army as your wage, as your reward. So Amr ibn al-As said, Ya Rasulullah, I did not embrace Islam to get wealth. And the Prophet said, I know you didn't. I know that you are sincere. And listen to this beautiful statement. You ready for it? He said, however, what's wrong? Pure money? A righteous money for a righteous man. What's wrong with a righteous man having righteous money? And what this tells us is money is not bad. It's not all bad. We always say, oh, rich people, they're bad. Uh, Wealth is bad for you. Wealth can be bad for you. But if you are righteous and you don't let the wealth take over you, then that righteous money is blessed for you. That righteous money is blessed for you. So you get the best of both worlds. Nothing wrong with a Muslim, a righteous Muslim, becoming a businessman, becoming an entrepreneur, getting wealth. Nothing wrong with it. And so he said, righteous money for a righteous man. Yeah, nothing wrong with it. So the Amr ibn al then took the commandship and he took those 300 soldiers with him. He sent with him uh, some soldiers with the Ansar and Muhajirin. And then when he was reaching the place, Amr ibn al-As realized that they're just, they're a small army and they're not going to be able to defeat the people there. That's how smart he was. So we sent a letter to the Prophet ﷺ saying, send me reinforcement. I need double the amount. So the Prophet ﷺ sent with him the elite of the companions. He sent him Abu Bakr, Umar, Ali, Uthman, and Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah. They're the elite of all the companions. And the Prophet ﷺ said to Abu, Abu Abed ibn al-Jarrah, he said, Go, you can lead this army until you get to Amr ibn al-As, and then I want you to follow him. He's the commander. Ya Abu Abeda, do not dispute with Amr. Because Amr was a type that you can easily dispute with him. He used to do things that a lot of people used to think it's unorthodox. Why is he doing that, man? So Abu Abeda went with that sort of attitude, thinking Amr ibn al-As is going to cause trouble for me here. And the Prophet ﷺ knew that. He knows what Amr ibn al-As is like. He knows every companion what he's like. So he said, don't dispute with him, Abu Ubaidah. <laughs> so Abu Ubaidah reaches him. And it came time for Asr prayer. Because Amr ibn al-As was the commander of the army, he is the one who has to lead the army in Salat. So he, only in war, the commander leads the army. He comes to lead and Abu Ubaidah goes forward. He wants to lead the prayer. Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah is called Amin Hadi al-Ummah, the trustworthy of this ummah. Amr ibn al-As looks at him and says, No, Muhammad, the Prophet ﷺ made me the commander, so I lead you in Salat. Abu Ubaidah said, No, I lead you in Salat. I'm the Amin of this Ummah. I lead you, I don't lead you. They had a dispute. Then Abu Ubaidah said, You know what, Ya Amr? You lead. And the only reason I'm going to let you lead is because the Prophet ﷺ commanded me not to dispute with you. So I'm not going to dispute with you. There is great wisdom in this, my brothers and sisters. Amr ibn al-As has only been six months a Muslim. He's not as great as Abu Ubaidah, Abu Bakr, or Umar. But why did the Prophet ﷺ get him to lead? Because he was the most qualified for this position that he, for this particular project. 
He was the most qualified for this particular project. And he said to him, don't dispute with him. Listen to him. And that teaches us that even if somebody is in charge of a project and you think you're better than them, or you think someone else is better than them, don't. Do not dispute and make it work. Do not dispute and then you will lose your aura. Umar ibn Khattab who looks at that situation and says to Abu Bakr, what's this? Who is Amr compared to Abu Ubaidah? And then Abu Bakr says to Umar, Ya Umar, the Prophet وسلم, would have never put Amr ibn al-As in this leadership position if he did not know that he is the best among us all for this position, for this particular position. And all of them respected that, subhanAllah. You see, brothers and sisters, sometimes we dispute, someone's a leader, we get jealous, and we say, you don't even know the tajweed of the Qur'an. Tell me, tell me. Tell me what are the letters of Ahruf al-Ghunna. You know, we throw. Or we mention some scholar that only a few people know that you have to read through the books. Do you even know what Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani said? And you just, you try to put them on the spot. We should not talk like that. We should respect the qualification of the person who is in leader. Is he able to do it? Is she able to do it? Yes, we respect that. Doesn't mean they're better than you or you better than them. Amr ibn al radiallahu anhu then led the prayer. And then what happens next? He, uh, it was night and it was very, very cold. I'll just finish it with this. Very, very cold. And some of the companions want to light up the fire so they can get warm. Amr ibn al said, nobody's allowed to light up fire. But yeah, we're cold, we're, we're freezing. So no one's allowed to light up the fire, no warmth. Some of the companions thought, who, who does he think he is not letting us light up? We want to be warm. No one's allowed, they had to obey him. Then next, after they slept that night, Amr ibn al wakes up and he has to still lead Fajr prayer. But he was Junub. You know what Junub is, right? Do you know what Junub is? How old are you boys? Seven. Can you close your ears? Oh, I need to say what Junub is. Yeah. No, don't worry, you can hear it. Junub is when you have a wet dream. What's wet dream? You pee in your bed. I knew they were going to say that. Anyway, the older people, you know what I'm saying. It's the Junub that when you wake up, you have to have a shower from it. You can't pray without having a shower. Okay? And by the way, having said this, we've got some young fellows here. If you have junub, it's enough for you just to let the water go all over your body once. It just So long as it reaches your skin, every part of your body, you can just chuck yourself under the shower, bang, you're out. So I don't want anyone saying, oh, you know, some students go to school and it's Lord time, I want to pray with us, and they say, I've got junub. So bro, wake up, you know, you know yourself, wake up like, you know, 10 minutes extra. All you got to do is just jump under the shower and it's gone. So it's that easy. I go, yeah, do that, what do you... What? What are you going to a wedding? Are you now a, a bride getting ready for a wedding? Just get under it, man, and get out. But my hair, but my skin, and get out of here, man. Now we've got little boys around. You're not a girl, don't be a princess. Even women do better than you now these days. So get up, get ready, go under the shower, finish from the junub and out. Anyway, having said that, Amr ibn al-As was in junub. So Amr ibn al-As, what does he do? He says, I'm leading the prayer and I'm not having a shower. I'm going to pray in the state of junub. I'm just going to make the yamun. Uh, not him, sorry, he made normal wudu and he prayed in Junub. Umar ibn Khattab looks at Abu Bakr and he goes to him, This guy's playing games with us, man. What's this? Abu Bakr said, Obey him, as the Prophet ﷺ placed him. Then they went, charged into the, the tribe, the, 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 the city where they were meant to fight. When they reached, they fought very heavily and they were about to conquer the place. Then what does Umar ibn Az do? He retreats. He goes, Go back, go back. And they all retreat. They didn't even take over the town. Le. What's this? They come. On their way, they're very hungry. On their way, they're very hungry. And they didn't have food. So they were starving almost to death. And suddenly they saw, they reached an ocean. And near the beach, they saw something very big and black. Washed off on shore. As they approached it, it was a huge, massive whale. I think it was a blue whale. How do I know? Because the companion said it was such a massive whale that there was an eye socket. We took out the eye because we ate it. We ate from it. And we could fit five men crouched inside of the eye socket of that whale. Five men. Some of us would have our camel and would stand on top of the camel just to try and reach, not even reach the, the, 
you know, the, the height of the whale. That's how big it was. So we didn't know whether we can eat it. You know, it's still halal and haram. We don't know. The Prophet ﷺ didn't tell me that he could. This was a washed off dead animal. Not slaughtered, not hunted, just washed off on the shore. And they didn't even know if they could eat that animal. Dead animal on the shore. But they were so hungry that they ate from it. All of them. When they reached the Prophet ﷺ, they said, Ya Rasulullah, we were starving and we had no other option but we ate from that whale. We didn't know if it was halal or haram. The Prophet ﷺ said to them, do you have any more of it? They said, yes. He said, give me some. And he started eating from it himself. And this is a fiqh mara that tells us, this is evidence that you are allowed to eat any, any creature that comes out from the sea. Any creature that lives in the sea, you're allowed to eat it. And if it's washed off and it's still fresh, obviously can't be decayed, you're allowed to eat it. So you don't have to slaughter fish or anything like that. You can eat shark, you can eat crustaceans. But there is the madhab of the ahnaf. The Hanafis do not eat crustaceans, such as crabs and seashells and stuff like that. But the rest of the madhabs do agree on that. And what Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, the correct opinion is that you can eat anything from the sea that is reliant and dependent on the sea to survive. Now, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Bahr huwa al-tahuru ma'ahu al In the hadith is in Sahih Muslim. That the Prophet ﷺ, and I think it's in Bukhari, he said about the ocean, all of the ocean is pure. So it's all you can make wudu from it, you can make ghusl from it, you can do, it's always pure. Al hil maytatuhu, anything that comes out of it dead is halal. Okay? This is something. Now he approached Amr and he said, Yeah, Amr, explain yourself. Why did you forbid them from lighting up the fire? He said, Ya Rasulullah, the enemy is just across and there's a large amount of them. And we're coming in not letting them know that we're there. If we light up the fire, if we lit up the fire, they can see us and then they'll attack us. So I didn't let anyone light it up. He said, okay, the Prophet ﷺ laughed. He said, what about the junub? Why do you pray junub? He said, Ya Rasulullah, it was a very cold night and I'd forbid them from lighting up the fire because then they'll attack us and kill us. So I couldn't light, I couldn't warm up any water. If I had used the cold water, it probably would have killed me or something would have happened. Not killed me, but it would have hurt. And I wouldn't light up the fire because I had forbidden it. So I prayed in Jum'ah. The Prophet ﷺ smiled and he said, You've done well. That's okay. Why did you retreat? He said, Ya Rasulullah, when I approached, I realized that they were more than double our amount. If we had taken over, they would realize that we are a small amount and they would beat us and kill us. So I retreated. SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ knew that he was not going to conquer that place. Yet he put him in there from a wisdom known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, they learned that the commander, you obey him. He's talking about unity of the Muslims and what it means. And the qualification of the person is what matters. If he's qualified for that position, it's good. He doesn't have to be qualified for everything. You might be qualified in one particular area of a project. Give it to that person. And leave your personal grudges aside. Leave your personal opinions aside. Leave your own opinions aside. If they're qualified for that position, let them. Right? Someone's good in IT, you give that to them. You don't say, oh, who is this person? Someone is qualified in making posters. Who is that person? No, you don't say that. It says qualified. Someone has to lead. I don't like him. He leads because they're qualified. So you give each person their position and each person according to their qualification. My brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, after this little battle that had happened, the Mu'ta battle and all of that stuff, we now arrive at the most important part. And what is that? The conquest of Mecca. I'll only say half of it today, and inshallah next week we'll say the other half. The, the tribe, Khuza'a, remember I mentioned them before, they had a problem with another tribe called Banu Bakr. Khuza'a were allies of the Prophet ﷺ, Banu Bakr were allies of the Meccans. So Khuza'a, some of them had embraced Islam, so they wanted to go to Mecca and do their Umrah and pray over there. They thought we're safe, right? So Khuza'a went to the Kaaba and they started doing their tawaf and started praying. So they were half Muslim and half not Muslim. There was a tribe called Banu Bakr, as I said, and they had their leader, he wanted revenge from Khuzah, something had happened in the past. So he looked at them and thought, you know what, I'm going to kill them. And he came up to a few of his people, Banu Bakr, and they said, all right, we agree with you. So he said, let's, let's betray it. And I mean, they knew that they were betraying the trust, the treaty, they were going to break the treaty of Hudaybiyah. Because if an ally of Mecca breaks the treaty, then it means that the whole of Quraysh has broken a treaty, right? So they waited for them outside of the Haram, the Mecca. The Haram is the little the area where you do tawaf and prayer. There's a particular distance for about a kilometer radius. That's the Haram. You're not allowed to kill in it. You're not allowed to fight in it. So he waited until they were outside the Haram a little bit in their tents. And in the night, they attacked them. 
this tribe or the allies of Quraysh, they attacked allies of the Muslims. They killed a few of their men and the Muslims realized, so they got up and they ran away from them into the Haram. Why? Because in the Haram not allowed to kill anyone. So their leader, he runs in from Khuza'a, from Bani Bakr, and his people, they say, it's the Haram, the Haram, the Haram, don't kill them. You know, Allah, Allah, it's Haram, don't kill them in there. And he said to them, what? You people are crooks anyway. You're liars. You don't even respect the Haram. Wallahi, I will fight them and kill them in there. There's no Haram today. So he broke even the Haram thing where you're not allowed to kill. He comes inside and starts killing and from the people of Banu Bakr. The Quraysh people saw him and some of them even took part. And some of the Quraysh just watched them. So the Quraysh themselves, they broke the treaty. Their allies broke the treaty. The Quraysh didn't stop them. And they did it inside the Haram. So it was an all-out breaking of the contract. Two years later, this was in the eighth year of Hijrah. Two years later, after they signed the treaty, the Quraysh broke the treaty. What happened? Uh, people from Khuza'a, he ran to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And when he reached there, he made a big poem. Big poem, which means they broke the treaty, they attacked us, they killed us. You should defend us. We have an allegiance with you. The Prophet ﷺ, when he heard this, he slapped his thighs and he said, We will give you victory, Wallahi. So he started to silently gather an army to go to Mecca and take her over. No Muslim knew about it. Not even Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, except for Aisha, radiallahu anha. So she started preparing wheat and food and things like that. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to keep it an absolute secret. He didn't want Meccans to know. Abu Sufyan, he received a bit of news about that. So they said, what should we do? They said, well, there was a guy who had apostated and he said, listen, why don't you go and kill the people who killed those Muslims? Or you go and you make a treaty, renew the treaty with Muhammad wasallam, Or you embrace Islam. They said, man, we can't agree with any of that. So Abu Sufyan was the leader of Quraysh. He goes, I will go and try to renew the contract. I'll go to Muhammad and I'll say, listen, you know, the contract worked. Let's make the contract new. So Abu Sufyan goes down to Medina. He enters and he didn't know if the Prophet ﷺ knew about it or not. So he goes to his house. He goes to the Prophet ﷺ's house. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had married who? He had married the daughter of Abu Sufyan, Ummu Habiba. Remember? We talked about that a couple of lessons ago. Abu Sufyan knocks, Ummu Habiba answers, and obviously he's a mahram too. So he enters the house, and Muhammad was not there. So Ummu Habiba welcomes him in. He's her father, even if he's a disbeliever. And he goes to sit on the mat of Muhammad sallallahu the mat. It was a straw mat that the Prophet slept on. And what is his house? It's very, very, very simple. He has a straw mat that's not even, like it's a little bit broken apart. The Prophet sallallahu is to sleep on it, and you can see the marks of the straws on his on his sides and on his cheeks, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very simple man. So what did Ummu Habiba do? As her father was going to sit on the mat of the Prophet sallallahu she folds it up and away from him. He wouldn't let him sit on it, her father. So he looks at her and says, hmm, have you folded it away because you think that your father is too noble than to sit on a cheap piece of mat? Or did you fold it away because you thought the mat your, your father is too cheap to sit on that precious mat? You understand? Is the mat too precious for me to sit on? Or am I too precious for me to sit on that mat? And she said, the mat is more precious than you. It's the mat of Rasulullah sallallahu and you are too impure to sit on it. Allah, even her father. This is what Islam did, subhanAllah. And he said to her, wow, Islam is more important than her own father? She said, yes. Rasulullah sallallahu is more important than me. So he goes to the masjid and he sees the Prophet sallallahu and he says, I want to, you know, the contract is working. There's so much good out of it. Let's renew the terms once again. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, We are still sticking by the contract, and we are not ones to betray. So Abu Sufyan knew that the Prophet ﷺ knew. So he goes to Abu Bakr. He says, Ya Abu Bakr, tell the Prophet, ask him, the contract is working, let's renew the contract once again. Abu Bakr didn't know, but all he said was the same thing. We are still sticking by the contract, you know, and we are not people to betray it. And I can't go against Muhammad So he goes, tell him to give us refuge. He goes, I can't say anything. You ask him. 
He goes, who should I go to who's, more on, who's honorable to the Prophet He said, go to Omar. <laughs> he goes to Omar, out of all people. He says, Ya Omar, you know, you're special to Muhammad. Tell him to renew the contract. Give us protection. Omar radiallahu looks and he says, me? Me out of all people? He goes, if it wasn't for Muhammad sallallahu I would have gone right now and all of you would have been ripped to pieces and died a long time ago. That treaty of Hudaybi, I didn't even want it. If it was up to me, all of you would be dead by now. So he says, wow, what a great man you are. Pity about the relationship that we had. Omar said, get out of my face. If it wasn't for the Prophet, I'd kill you right now. So he goes to Uthman. He tells him the same thing. He said, I'm not going to take the Prophet spot. So then he goes to Ali, the cousin of the Prophet. He enters and he says, yeah, Ali, please, you know, let's renew the contract. Give us, you know, pledge, you know, give us protection or whatever. And Ali, the Allah, says, hey, I'm not one to take over Muhammad command. So he said, what should I do? He goes, I don't know. Go to someone else. So he looks at Fatima, the Prophet's daughter. He says, what about you? He says, I'm not going to talk in front, you know, take over the words of my father, the Prophet. So he sees Al-Hassan. Al-Hassan is about 10 years old. He looks at him and he goes, what about that kid? I mean, he's the grandson of Muhammad. Can't he? Give us protection. You're like, just say that he gives us protection. Fatima looks at him and says, he's a kid. He's a child. Children don't give these allegiances or these protection. So he goes to Ali, give me something. I want to work out something. So Ali says to him, well, you, you're the, you know, you're the leader of Quraysh. Why don't you get up and say, everybody, the people of Mecca are under my protection. He goes, you think they'll listen? You think I'm honorable that much? He goes, yeah, yeah you're the leader. You're the leader. Go, why don't you try it? So he believes him. He goes to the masjid, he goes, everyone, me, the leader of Quraysh, all the people of Mecca are under my protection, the leader. And then the Prophet ﷺ looks at him and he says, that's what you think. <laughs> if you had let him go, it means that he agrees, silence his approval. So he goes, well, that's what you're saying. And so Abu Sufyan knew that his words are nothing. So he gave up and goes back to Quraysh and he says, people... I advise you to surrender. These people are going to get us. So they said, what happened? They said, I even went and said protection under me. And they said, what do you mean protection? You're the enemy. And you think that they're going to, they're going to listen to you saying that they're protected? He said, Ali, Ali told me to do that. And they said, Wallah, Ali played a big game with you. You're so naive and stupid. He says, listen, the only way I see it is surrender. Now, Abu Sufyan is a businessman. He looks at what, you know, gains and losses. So he goes, we're going to lose. So Hind, his wife, she gets up in front of everybody and says to him, you coward of a man, surrender. And she says in Arabic, give me your moustache. Grip. An Arab thing, you grab a person, a man's moustache, it means pew on you. What a coward of a man you are. You don't deserve that moustache, this honor. So she grabs his moustache and says, You are a coward. He tells her, Shut up, woman. That's what he said. Get into your house. Is that the Arabs? And he turns to the people and says, Don't listen to what she's saying. I know what I'm saying. These people, Muslims, they're too powerful. Surrender now and count your losses. They said, No, we won't. So they waited. The Muslims gathered the army. Abu Bakr enters to Aisha and his daughter and finds her preparing food and stuff. She said, did Muhammad did the Prophet tell you what we're going to do? Are we going to go to Persia? She goes, she wouldn't answer. She says, the Romans? She wouldn't answer. She says, then to where? Khuzam? I mean, the, Banu this or Banu that? She wouldn't answer. The Prophet had told Aisha and told her not to say anything. Not even to her father. And subhanAllah, she stuck with that secret. SubhanAllah, today a lot of us, we're not really good at keeping secrets. Someone comes and tells you a secret and we straight away tell it to anyone else. And you know, especially women. Women do, right? Always. Secrets go out very quickly, backbiting, gossiping. And you know, you can probably get upset with me, but that's the truth. Now, Aisha Radulam is a great example. She wouldn't say the, the secret. So the Prophet ﷺ enters and Abu Bakr Radulam says, Ya Rasulullah, where? He says, Makkah. He goes, go and conquer Makkah. He goes, yeah, he goes, we're in a treaty with them. He said, they've broken the treaty, yeah, Sadiq. He said, okay, I get it. He gathered all the Muslims 
And there were about 7,500 Muslims. In two years, 7,500 Muslims was the amount of the Muslims. On their way, they were going towards Mecca. What happened? Another tribe, a big tribe, Banu Sulaim, I think it was called. There were a thousand warriors on horses. They were galloping towards the Prophet ﷺ with armor. And the Prophet ﷺ smiled. He says, they're coming to embrace Islam. They entered and they said, we embrace Islam, Ya Rasulullah. And they joined them as well. So now there were 8,500 warriors, soldiers, heading towards Mecca. Uh, Mecca's not going to be able to win. Is it time for Maghrib? Three minutes. How much? Three minutes? Three minutes? Yeah. They entered... And they arrived about, I would say, 10 kilometers away from Mecca. And they settled there and camped for a little while. As they were outside of Mecca, uh, a man came out. He was migrating. And the Prophet ﷺ got so happy for him. He was Al-Abbas, the Prophet's uncle from his father's side. He comes, was migrating. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm doing hijrah outside of Mecca, going to Medina. I didn't know that you're here. He said, come, come, uncle. He hugged him and he stayed with him, was doing migration. And Al-Abbas is the last person to migrate, to do hijrah. Because when the Prophet ﷺ takes over Mecca, he's going to say, لا هجرة بعد الفتح. There is no more migration, hijrah, from Mecca to Medina after the Fatih. And so he was the last man to make hijrah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to honor him with that. Al-Abbas knew that he was going to go and take over Mecca. Al-Abbas thought, man, this is not good. Why should you take him over? I want them to embrace Islam. In the meantime, Hatib radiallahu anhu, a great companion who fought in Badr, he had family in Mecca that were poor. And he feared that the Meccans will kill them. So he secretly wrote a letter informing them that Muhammad is coming in, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, warning them. And, the problem, and that, that's a betrayal. So he sent it with a woman in secret. This woman went and Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet alayhi salam telling him, this is what Hatib did. So he sent Ali radiallahu and two people with them saying, go and extract, get that letter back for me. They reached the woman and said, where's the letter? She said, I don't have any letters. And Ali radiallahu anhu said, the Prophet alayhi salam is not a liar. Jibreel said he's truthful. And all of us said he's truthful. He's not a liar. He said, if you don't give it to us, we are going to look through your belongings, even through your clothing, whatever it takes. So they looked through their camel and everything, and she realized she has to give in. She took off her scarf, and it was hidden inside her hair. And she gave him the letter, and it was Hatib informing the Meccans that Muhammad has come with an army. When uh, the Prophet found out, he looked at Hatib, he called him. And Umar radiallahu anhu stood up first. He said, Ya Rasulullah, da'ni adrubu un unuqa. Let me kill him. Inna hu nafaqa. He had, he's a hypocrite, Ya Rasulullah. He's done hypocrisy. And what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? He said, Ya Hatib, why did you do what you did? And Hatib said, Ya Rasulullah, just listen to what I have to say first. I have a family in there and they're poor. They got no one to protect them. I left them there when I migrated. And these people, when they find out that we are entering they'll probably go to my family and kill them. So I thought if I wrote a letter to them, maybe they will look and find compassion towards me for helping them out, just to save my family, Ya Rasulullah. Umar radiallahu anhu looks up and says, save your family by massacring a whole nation of Ummah, all these people, get, give them a head start for your own family, you put your own desires above this. The Prophet ﷺ said to Umar, be quiet, Ya Umar, leave him alone. For Wallahi fakannan, he goes, I remember. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to through Jibreel to me, O oh people of Badr, he was a fighter in battle of Badr, do whatever you wish after this, no sin will harm you ever again. Leave him. Allah will forgive him. Don't harm him, subhanAllah. He made a mistake. And truly Rasulullah forgave him. My brothers and sisters, Abu Sufyan heard about some news. So he tried to go out to speak to the Prophet ﷺ. And he met Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas said to him, embrace Islam, embrace Islam, it's not going to be good. So Abu Sufyan goes, I still have doubt. He said, how can you have doubt after all of this? He sat with the Prophet ﷺ and he said the Shahada. But he said it hesitantly. 
I think it was Bilal radiallahu anhu who said to him, if we cut off your head, the doubt will go. But Abu Sufyan was still hesitant. But he said it. However, later on, he finds out that Islam is the truth and he becomes a true Muslim. Brothers and sisters in Islam, inshallah next week, I will tell you what happens next, what happens with Abu Sufyan, how the Muslims enter, what are the few things that happen there, what do the Prophet ﷺ say, what happens to Hind, what happens to Ikrima, what happens to all these people. We're going to gather some very valuable lessons from it. Inshallah, as I said, three more lessons and we will be done with the seerah, inshallah ta'ala. And then we'll have a bit of a break. We'll have a few weeks, inshallah. I'll let you know when we'll return. And possibly, inshallah, probably, which is more of a, prompt, more of a hope, uh, we'll start a new series, inshallah. I haven't decided yet. But if you guys have any suggestions, inshallah, you can well always be ready to hear. If you want to send it through Facebook, you want to tell Brother Jamal, who is here from the Masjid, where's Jamal? Jamal. He just came in from the Masjid. You want to tell the people of the Masjid. And the news, inshallah, will come to me of what topics you would like me to address, inshallah ta'ala. If you can, not as long as the seerah, because it's just too long, inshallah. And I've actually summarized it a lot. I thank you for listening. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa to accept this from us. And whatever mistake I made is from myself. Whatever truth I said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.